So welcome to the Department of Orthopedics Grand Rounds. Dr. Chapman has asked me to introduce our August trauma faculty. Uh, we're going to be talking about pelvic ring injuries, how to evaluate them, how to manage them, how to, manage them, how to survive them. We're going to start off with Nick Iannuzzi, who's one of the R floors. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Today we'll be discussing pelvic ring injuries, their evaluation and management. Disclosures are as noted above. I'd like to start by presenting a case that was treated at Harvey Medical Center earlier this year. We will return to the case as we continue our presentation in order to highlight principles of evaluation and treatment that we discuss. In our case, a 56-year-old male is brought to Harvey Medical Center as part of a trauma code. Upon presentation to the ER, it's reported that the patient has been crushed between two cars. His vital signs include a heart rate of 40 to 50, systolic blood pressure of 64, and he is intubated and sedated. As we continue to follow this case towards its conclusion, we would like to review the epidemiology of pelvic ring injuries, their anatomy, evaluation and classification, their emergency management, definitive fixation, and finally their outcomes. At the end of our presentation, there will be a brief opportunity for discussion. Regarding the epidemiology of pelvic injuries, these injuries occur in a bimodal distribution divided into both low injury falls and high energy injuries involving motorbike accidents, pedestrian versus vehicles, motor vehicle collisions. <clears throat> One study out of a single trauma center in New South Wales, Australia demonstrated an incidence of uh, pelvic ring injuries of approximately 23 per 100,000 people. These were divided evenly between low energy and high energy injuries. And a second study based on the Trauma Audit and Research Network in England in <clears throat> was performed in which the authors noted that pelvic ring injuries constituted uh, up to 8% of admissions in their hospital group. So what is the pelvis? Pelvis is Latin for basin, and the role of this basin is to support and contain the intra-abdominal and intrapelvic organs. But the pelvis also serves to transmit forces from the lower extremities to the axial skeleton. Pelvis consists of the sacrum and two innominate bones, but the bony structure has no intrinsic stability without support of its ligamentous connections. The ligaments of the pelvis provide both rotational and vertical stability. The pubic symphysis provides rotational control of the anterior aspect of the pelvis and is often noted to act as a strut. The posterior and interosseous ligaments are the strongest ligaments within the pelvic ring. These ligaments withstand the forces of weight bearing and prevent vertical migration of the innominate bones with respect to the sacrum. The anterior sacroiliac ligaments prevent rotational displacement in the posterior ring and the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments provide additional rotational and vertical stability with the sacrotuberous ligament forming a portion of the pelvic floor. The iliolumbar ligaments run from L4 and L5 to the ilium and anchor the pelvis to the lumbar spine. Regarding the neurological anatomy, the T12 through S4 nerves are closely intertwined with the pelvis. The sacral tunnels pass in a superior, posterior, medial to inferior anterolateral direction and contain the nerve roots of S1 and through S4, while L4 and L5 nerve roots join at the sacral promontory to form the lumbosacral trunk, and L5 travels over the sacral ala near the superior aspect of the SI joint. Together, these roots form the sciatic nerve exiting the pelvis through the greater sciatic notch. L2 through L4 travel over the psoas and iliacus and exit the pelvis over the superior pubic ramus and beneath the uh, inguinal ligament, forming the femoral and saphenous nerves. And other nerves important for lower extremity and function include the superior and inferior gluteal nerves, <clears throat> as well as the obturator nerve. The pelvis is a highly vascular structure. The internal iliac vessels give rise to the superior and inferior gluteal <clears throat> Uh, vessels which are at risk of avulsion injuries due to disruption of the SI joint. The external iliac vessels become the femoral vessels as they exit over the pelvic rim beneath the inguinal ligament and above the superior pubic rami. The presacral venous plexus is often the cause of substantial bleeding after pelvic fractures and is not visible in this angiogram. And finally, the often mentioned corona mortis, mortis exists as an anastomosis between the external iliac and obturator vessels, is present in at least one third of patients, and is at risk during pelvic injury and approaches to the anterior pelvic ring. Upon initial evaluation of pelvic ring injuries, it's important to understand that these injuries often are associated with other trauma. It is also important to begin with a thorough physical evaluation with multiple teams working together. And at our institution, the initial evaluation of a patient with a high energy pelvic ring injury will often include 
general surgery, orthopedic, and emergency medicine teams. A thorough secondary survey should be performed, including evaluation for other orthopedic injuries, the condition of the soft tissues, stability of the pelvic ring, and rectal, urological, and neurological exams should be performed. Radiology, radiological evaluation is often incorporated into the secondary survey. A trauma series is often performed and consists of an AP radiograph of the pelvis, in addition to the C-spine and the AP chest films. This AP pelvis x-ray is generally oblique to the pelvic brim due to the lumbar lordosis and the orientation of the pelvis with respect to the spine. This radiograph can be examined for symmetry between sides of the pelvis, SI joint widening, buckling within the sacral foramen, fractures of the sacrum or within the anominate bones, pubic symphysis widening, and other injuries. Orthogonal views complete the plain x-ray <coughs> series. These consist of inlet and outlet views of the pelvis. An adequate inlet view superimposes the anterior aspects of the uh, upper sacral bodies. An adequate outlet view superimposes superior pubic symphysis on the body of S2. These provide more information regarding rotation, anterior posterior displacement, vertical migration of the hemipelvis with respect to the, uh, one another. It's important to realize that these radiographs are a static red <coughs> representation of potential instability. A uh, study by Mike Gardner and Dr. Krieg demonstrated that fractures of the pelvis created from anterior to posterior compressive mechanisms may recoil up to 50%, and those injuries created from lateral compressive mechanisms may recoil up to 80%. So what you see on the radiograph does not necessarily do the injury justice. CT scans represent an important adjunct imaging study from both a bony and soft tissue standpoint. A CT scan has been proven more sensitive than simple AP radiography, and a study published in 2005 in Sweden demonstrated that 11% of patients with injuries on CT had normal AP radiographs. In addition, another study <clears throat> demonstrated that patients with anterior ring injuries had posterior injuries approximately 96.8% of the time. And here in the lower uh, portions of the slide, we can see a patient with superior pubic root <coughs> injury as well as a type Denny type 3 sacral injury, which is not apparent on the AP radiograph. Classification of injury follows three main schema. The Young and Burgess classification was introduced in 1986 and is based on proposed direction of force causing the injury uh, and grouped into anterior, posterior, lateral compression, vertical shear, and combined mechanism categories. Increasing grades within the same injury category imply decreasing stability of the uh, pelvic ring, though this classification system does have some problems. Inner observer studies have demonstrated good agreement. However, a study performed which looked at the injury mechanism based on um, traffic uh, data uh, versus the, the uh, direction of force ascribed to the injury based on radiographs had less agreement. Uh, despite these issues, the system has been studied with respect to associated injuries. Uh, anterior posterior injuries are noted to have high rates of hemorrhage, shock, and need for transfusion. And lateral compression injuries are noted for higher rates of intra-abdominal injury. The Pinnell and Tile classification is based on an initial classification system uh, by Pinnell in 1961 and modified by Tile to group pelvic fractures by stability in addition to the direction of force. Group A represents pelvic fractures in which the ring remains stable. Group B represents partially rotationally unstable injuries, and group C injuries represent completely both rotationally and vertically unstable injuries. Uh, Tile proposed this classification system as a way to help guide treatment. In gross terms, group A injuries required uh, limited additional treatment. Group B injuries required treatment to address the anterior ring, and group C injuries required treatment that addressed both the anterior and posterior rings. Finally, the anatomic classification, often attributed to Letournelle, but not to be confused with this acetabular classification is also utilized. The scheme is meant to describe the injury in anatomic terms, and as such can be more accurate and may be of the most benefit to the treating physician. Returning to our case presentation, after radiographs and CT scan were performed, he was noted to have a left hemipelvic dissociation with avulsion of the posterior sacrum, left parasymphyseal fracture, pubic symphysis dislocation, and right uh, anterior SI joint widening. Not to be forgotten are the soft tissue injuries as well, which include arterial blush posterior to the right hip in the area of the superior gluteal uh, vessels, presence of a urinoma and hematoma, 
uh, anterior to the pubic symphysis and presence of a high riding superiorly displaced bladder. Discussing emergency management will be Dr. James Creek. Thanks, Nick. That's a good background, and we're just going to talk for about 10 minutes on the emergent management of a patient with a pelvic fracture who's hemodynamically unstable. Uh, Nick mentioned my disclosures. I do get royalties from a sling, and uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but I will talk a lot about the research that we uh, worked on in development of that that was supported by the Department of Defense. So hemodynamic instability, as anybody who has taken ATLS uh, recognizes, one of the basic tenets of ATLS is this concept that evaluation and intervention should occur simultaneously. So real important when time matters. As surgeons, we also follow another principle that when confronted with hemorrhage, we typically rely on direct means of control, whether it's a finger applying pressure, a hemostat, a ligature, what have you. But in pelvic trauma, we often don't have that to our disposal, and so we often rely on indirect means of control of hemodynamic instability. So over the years, a number of uh, protocols have evolved in different settings to handle the hemodynamically unstable patient. Uh, and they all seem to have several common themes that I'll touch on here or components. Uh, so first and foremost is aggressive fluid resuscitation. And this involves the early use of blood products, not waiting until the patient has gone too far down the path of instability. Again, one that's often overlooked is active warming of the patient. It's a fact that once the patient's core temperature drops below 35 degrees, the ability for the clotting cascade to, to take effect is quite limited and often uh, will be ineffective. This concept of providing provisional reduction or stability really is the mainstay of the orthopedic role. And we'll talk a bit about different ways to achieve that. But really, the goals are to, number one, provide some patient comfort. And certainly, when a patient is in shock, that's of value. But also to, to try and allow for the patient to clot this blood that's forming uh, or collecting in the pelvic area and to protect that clot through the course of their care. Of course, angiography has a role that one could argue has grown over the past decade, and we'll touch on that. And now we're starting to hear a little bit about, in North America, the use of pelvic packing. So over the years, again, many of us have been taught this concept that reducing the open book pelvis decreases the volume of the retroperitoneal space, thereby causing a tamponade effect. In reality, this is one of the components that we looked at in the early 2000s, uh, and uh, this is something that we did in a number of ways. One is computer modeling of 3D uh, CT imaging. And so if you use a 3D rendering of the volume of the pelvis, you find that even in this relatively unstable scenario, which is based on a true pa pa patient case, um, the reduction in volume is really only 10%, which it's hard to fathom how much pressure increase you can get from that. We followed that up with a cadaver study that actually bore that out uh, and uh, was actually previously done in, uh, at Case Western in the mid-1990s, early 1990s. And really what we found is that the retroperitoneal uh, space is such a large potential space going all the way up to the diaphragm that it's really, again, hard to fathom a reduction in pelvic volume, increasing pressure, and causing tamponade. However, we know that it works. There's clinical series after clinical series that shows that, that providing provisional stability does confer benefit to the patient. And over the years, really for most of us, the mainstay was external fixation for a long, long time. Uh, and back when I was in training, the standard frame configuration involved pins that were placed behind the ASIS and the gluteus medius pillar. Uh, but over the perhaps the last decade, maybe more recent in many centers, people have been trending more towards using pins that are placed in the supraacetabular region. This is something that confers much more biomechanical stability. It also tends to be better tolerated by patients. So external fixation is really synonymous for many people with provisional stability. But there are other ways of achieving it. Again, there was a the development of this type of posterior pelvic clamp that you see on your left with a patient example on the right, uh, courtesy of Dr. Rout, with a C-type injury that reduces quite well. And you can see if you look closely at this picture of the clinical photo that this is being done in the angiography suite. So one of the uh, advantages that was touted of this type of posterior clamp is that it didn't require the use of an operating room and could be put on in the resuscitation bay. Um, along came this uh, interesting finding that was really serendipity that patients that were placed in the military anti-shock garment or, or pneumatic anti-shock garment many times would have a reduction of their pelvic ring simply by applying this device that wasn't really uh, intended for that. And so that started this idea that maybe providing some kind of circumferential wrap around the patient would confer provisional stability. And of course now most of us are familiar with the techniques of sheeting, either binders or belts or what have you, to provide that circumferential 
provisional stabilization, which we'll get into in a little bit more detail in a second. And of course, any of these means can be supplemented by the use of traction. Again, uh, many times people think in simple terms of the rotational instability or the displacement that is obvious on an AP X-ray, but traction can be very helpful in, in augmenting any of those means to deal with the vertical instability of the severe injuries. Because much of this involved external fixation in the operating room, it was really a hot topic about a decade ago. In fact, almost exactly 12 years ago to this week, there was a joint meeting of the OTA and the uh, AAST, which is the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma, and that was down in San Antonio. And the real goal here was to try and achieve some consensus in that algorithm for what is the role of external fixation and what is the role of angiography and how do they fit into the timing of resuscitation. But I would argue that the timing of stabilization really is determined by the means that one chooses or the mechanism. And if you start here on the right, you, again, if you recognize that ORIF for many years was the only means of stabilizing the pelvis, you also realize that this occurs far after the injury, has to be done in the operating room, and requires quite a bit of resources. So that was really the impetus for the development of external fixation. It could be done sooner in the pathway and didn't require quite as much intervention, not as much risk to the patient. It's also the impetus for this, for this posterior seat clamp type device, that provisional external fixator that we saw in the photo. Again, it was designed to be put on in the trauma bay, not only to be a little bit more biomechanically advantageous in some patterns, but to be put on a bit sooner in the course of the care of the patient. And of course, now that we're wrapping sheets around people and using circumferential wrap, and in the days of the pneumatic anti-shock garments, we realize that we really come down the timeline to the scene in many cases. Certainly this community is one where the Medic uh, One folks are very familiar with wrapping a sheet on in the, in the field. And of course the resources re utilized are quite minimal. So if you were to look at where we've come from and where we are now, you realize that we've made quite a number of gains, but where did they come from and what does it mean? So as part of the research that I was participating in in Portland around 2000, we tried to ask the question, how effective is the sheet or the wrap relative to what we knew to be effective, which was the external fixator? This is a busy graph here, but if you just focus on the bar graphs, the pictures with the colors, this is a model of an unconstrained APC fracture. So this is a, 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 a C-type injury with rotational instability in both external and internal rotation and flexion and, and extension. And that's really just applying a load to the pelvis and seeing how much it displaces. If you go all the way to the right-hand side here, that's an anterior external fixator, a two-pin frame. Somewhere in the middle, you see the posterior C-clamp, and you see a circum circumferential wrap around the pelvis. So the first thing we realized was that, you know, you may not get the greatest stability with circumferential wrapping, but it's really pretty darn good. And it's certainly a lot of bang for your buck when you think about what it takes to get there. If you look back to the literature and you talk to the folks who really came up with the technique, a couple of them are in this room actually. The first patient that anybody here is aware of that this was done was actually around 1993. Dr. Rout can correct me if the dates are wrong. Uh, and this was uh, a case that uh, was being taken care of by Dave Teague, who was a fellow at the time, now the chairman in Oklahoma. Uh, Winston Warm, who's obviously on faculty here, who was, I believe, the rotating resident for Madigan. And uh, David Levinson, who was a UW resident. Somewhere along the line, one of those three up in the ER got the idea that this patient who was dying, uh, who was an extremist, might benefit from wrapping their pelvis, and lo and behold, it worked. Um, if you look to the literature for evidence, of course, it didn't appear for quite some time. The first appearance in the literature is actually a, an invited article that Dr. Rout participated in in 1995. It was the, the Harborview Resuscitation Protocol for Unstable Pelvic Patients. And it appeared in CORE uh, and really mentioned sheeting as a mainstay of provisional fixation. Again, not much in the literature for a number of years. In 1997, partly because I believe the role of Jerry Jerkovich, the ATLS provider manual taught cheating in the field or cheating in the resuscitation phase as a helpful means of providing provisional fixation and reduction. But again, nothing in the orthopedic literature until 2002 uh, when there were two case reports, one by Chip and one by myself, that came out at about the same time. And then, of course, there were a number of biomechanical studies that we elucidated further and, and later that year that talked a little bit about how it works and how you should perform it. So the first question, as far as how do you do it, is where do you put a sheet or where do you put a binder or a sling? And we looked at this as one of the, the uh, independent uh, variables and found that by far the most effective place for you to wrap a pelvis is at the level of the trochanters. Not intuitive for many people. They think that it should be higher, but the level of the trochanters applies the force through the hip joints to reduce the pelvis. Uh, 
how much force is needed? Well, we looked at that as well and found that in an unstable, externally rotated open book pelvis, it's about 150 to 170 newtons. Try and translate that into what most of us are more familiar with. It's about 15 to 17 kilograms of pressure. It's not a tremendous amount of pressure. So this doesn't need to be a tug of war between two strong individuals. Of course, after you put a sheet on, the question then is, what is the role of angiography and what is the role of pelvic packing? And again, just to sort of summarize the, where we are now with the, with the wrapping, you know, this whole discussion of when to stabilize and how to stabilize, I believe, has become a moot point. Because wrapping a pelvis is so effective relative to all of the other invasive means and can be done so early on in the care of the patient, it really should become the mainstay of provisional fixation. So again, the role of angiography is probably still expanding, and that may or may not be due to more simply the, the uh, more access to resources uh, rather than true patient need or indication. Regardless, we see lots of it, and people ask, when should they go to angio? And probably the two scenarios that folks tend to agree on is when the patient remains hemodynamically unstable despite an aggressive resuscitation and some degree of reduction in stabilization. In addition, some argue that if you see active bleeding on a CT scan, a blush on the CT, that's an indication for an angio because typically that represents arterial bleeding, which may or, not, may or may not respond as well to circumferential wrapping and aggressive resuscitation. Pelvic packing is a little bit more controversial. It's used quite a bit in Europe. In North America, there are only a few centers that routinely pack the pelvis, one of which is in Denver. So again, I would argue that if you're going to be participating in this type of resuscitation effort, you probably ought to talk to folks with a bit more experience to understand a little bit better the, the pros and cons, the risk-benefit profile before you undertake it, because I would imagine that there are some significant risks if not done appropriately. So to sort of summarize, again, I think this is perhaps the most important part of the morning for most of you in the room because this is the one instance where you as an orthopedist can make a real difference even if you're not involved in the definitive management of pelvic injuries. The role of the orthopedist really is to be involved early, and that involves not just actually taking care of the patient, but in helping with some of the decision-making that's going on. And so you may not be actively treating the patient, but you ought to be discussing the role of the orthopedic care somewhere with the, the folks that are doing the resuscitation itself. And again, this concept that evaluation and resuscitation occur simultaneously uh, during the earliest possible course uh, of the patient care. Um, this, again, the idea that the orthopedist can provide a reduction in stability, I think we've really simplified it. Wrap them up. And, and if nothing else, wrap them up and think about traction. Um, and again, as far as decision making, anticipate some of the things that are going to be involved in the, in the reconstruction down the road. Talk to people about where they're going to put their incisions. Talk to the people that are involved as far as resuscitation and other injuries about timing of surgery, et cetera. Because if nothing else, you can help plan for a more successful outcome. So to revisit this case presentation that Nick showed, again, in the ER, again, I think we should all recognize now that the role of the orthopedist is, I think, pretty straightforward as far as the decision making. This patient was sheeted. You can see the clamps here that hold the sheet in place. You can see a relative reduction. It's certainly not an anatomic reduction, but it's a relative reduction in relative stability. He, he did go to angiography. And this is uh, just, again, to mention the massive transfusion protocol, getting to blood products early and aggressively in order to maintain as much of the normal hemodynamics as possible. Uh, he continu continued in the ICU uh, management to, again, be resheeted. If you find that through the course of the patient rolling through the hospital, the sheet becomes a bit loose or displaced, don't hesitate to rewrap it, but you don't need to take it down every uh, couple of hours to examine the patient. Um, and again, the patient did go to angiography because he remained unstable. You can see that he's had coils placed and eventually was prepared to go to the operating room. So that concludes the part about resuscitation and pass the baton to, to Chip Rout. This is what the posterior ring has been historically for most of you that have uh, been in orthopedic surgery. Most people don't go into orthopedic surgery to take care of uh, patients with pelvic fractures because they can die. And I don't think any of us signed up for orthopedics because we wanted to take care of people that uh, might die. We like to take care of people that are well and they want to get weller or do more. But the posterior pelvic ring, at least when I uh, first started, was really uh, like the grizzly bear about to attack you. And this is why. Uh, the modern era really didn't help us a whole lot. You can see that uh, this anatomy for most of us uh, was, is uh, and was pretty unfamiliar. And the injury patterns, as the EMTs got better and better over the years, the injury patterns got more and more complex. We saw fairly simple things early on because patients didn't survive their time to or in the ER. And as the ER 
people and the resuscitation protocols and the paramedics got better, we had trouble because all of a sudden we had people with injuries that we really hadn't seen much. The exposures of the posterior pelvic ring were pretty unfamiliar, and then Jim Kellum let us know early in the, the 80s that not only were they unfamiliar, that the patients were lying on them, and they were stooling on them, and they weren't getting off of them, and they were hurt really badly to begin with due to the trauma, and so you ended up with the result like you see here, a patient from the late 90s with bilateral posterior pelvic uh, significant wound problems. We also still have trouble with the indications of the posterior pelvic ring. There are people that will argue until they almost die uh, with one another trying to tell you what does or what doesn't need to be operated on in the posterior pelvic ring. And the reason is, is most people have fairly random experience. Most centers divide out this um, patient population to five or six or three or four people, and everybody has a different set of skills, and so no one really knows what to do. The other problem was external fixation became real popular in the 70s, and so getting to the posterior pelvic ring with a patient prone with a frame on mandated that you had to be a little creative with positioning, and so people were putting two tables together, two OR tables to suspend the external fixation device. And you can see here a slide on the bottom that Dr. Hansen loaned me from 1985 of a patient here in Harborview in room three, and you can see that um, spike of casts were used for pelvic fractures along with external fixation devices. So this is 1985. We didn't do very good over 30 years. We haven't really made a lot of progress. We've made a lot of progress with product development and sales. And we've got surgeons now that are just mostly doing sales. And they have big voices and they'll sell you tables and devices but they're not going to teach you much about what to do and so we've gone wayward we've got posterior pelvic implants that go up to the spine and we've got just an array of implants that can be tossed into the posterior ring even though there's no reduction some people still try to over fix the front because they don't know really what to do with the back and so they'll double plate and then you can see this device this c-clamp device sometimes it it doesn't always go to the posterior pelvic ring. Sometimes it finds its way to the rectum, and that's not a good thing either. So we've got a real problem, I think, in our community where we have marketing over knowledge. And there's a lot of people with knowledge, but um, most of them are at home working, and um, they're not out selling and teaching as much as maybe they should be. So I'd ask you to step back when you take care of a patient with a pelvic ring disruption and personalize it a little bit. Pretend it's you or your mom or someone you like and then think about a broken door. And if you'll just think about a broken door and understand the anatomy of a door, you'll be just fine and you'll get through it real well and your patient will do real well too. And so if you realize a door has a strike side, that's the side that uh, is not the hinge side, it's the side that closes together in the middle of the doors. And if you think about the pelvis as sort of French doors, strike side would be where the, the latch is and where the lock is. And then the frame or the hinge side is of course where the hinge is. And if you think about the pelvis, that's about all you need to know right there. You're, we could go home right now and we'll be through. But we'll talk a little bit more about the posterior pelvic ring. And people say, well, what is the posterior pelvis? The posterior pelvis involves an iliac fracture. So if you have an iliac fracture that goes from the crest down through the greater notch, that's an unstable posterior pelvic ring injury. If you have a sacroiliac joint fracture or a sacroiliac joint fracture dislocation or a pure dislocation, like you see down here on the, the lower left, that's a posterior pelvic ring injury. And if you have a sacrum that looks like it's uh, six inches away from its home, that's a posterior pelvic ring injury. And so those are fairly extreme varieties of the posterior pelvis. Some people say, does the posterior pelvis really, really matter? It does to this patient. This woman slithered into my clinic about three, three years ago. She had non-displaced fractures on her original film. These were just little cracks. Nobody ever felt her pelvis. Nobody ever examined her. She complained of terrific pain. She was treated the way we like to treat people, and we try not to do too much. We don't hurt her, you know. And so now she's got this six months later. She can't walk. Uh, she can barely get around. She's totally uncomfortable, and her pelvis is grossly unstable. And you can imagine the plethora of bowel and bladder and other problems that she has. This is just three years ago uh, in modern America. So we're, we're still not quite getting it. So let's just talk a little bit about who needs surgery on the posterior pelvic ring. I think this is a little bit of a no-brainer. It's uh, people who have instability of the posterior pelvic ring. And see so people say, well, what is, what is instability? Instability is when you have the inability to resist physiological loads. And <laughs> that's a physiological load. 
If you can't cough or roll over in bed because it hurts so bad, your pelvis is probably unstable somewhere. You may have a Volster iliac crest and you can't cough because your abdominal obliques insert into it. That's instability. So we have obvious instability. Where you look at the films, you can see both of these films. That right sacrum on the patient on the lower left there, you can see that displaced right transframinal sacral fracture. That's an unstable pelvic ring disruption. That's a no-brainer. You can see the other one has bilateral sacroiliac joint disruptions. And so we're not going to miss these obvious ones. The ones that we're going to have trouble with are the ones that are still approximated, the minimally displaced to the non-displaced, that we're going to be hopeful that they're going to be stable because we're scared to treat them. If you were a medical student, who's a medical student? Raise your hand. Good. You know SOAP notes? Do you all still do SOAP notes, subjective, objective assessment in a plan? Under subjective, your patient is going to be bitterly complaining to you if they have an unstable pelvic ring disruption. They are not going to be comfortable at all. You're not going to be able to do much to them. And if you come at them to examine them, they're going to be very scared of you because they hurt so bad. Under objective, when you examine the patient and you compress their iliac crest, you're going to feel it collapse in your hands. That's going to be the objective finding. So despite minimal displacement, we're going to have subjective pain. We're going to have a patient who can't mobilize, even though we try. And then if we examine them, we're going to feel them collapse. And if we examine them in the operating room and just put the fluoroscopy on their pelvis, we can see it collapse in our, we can feel it in our hands and we can see it with our eyes. So again, just like the door, the unstable pelvis, is pretty simple to identify when it's broken. You have to listen to the patient if they're talking, and you have to feel the patient. And then you don't have patients slithering into your office three years later. We can fix these real simplistically. I mean, it's not so hard. If they collapse in our hands and they can't move or walk, we can make little stab wounds in the front part of the pelvis, little stab wounds in the back part of the pelvis, and we can load up these broken areas with screws very, very safely, and that provides intrinsic stability for the pelvis so it doesn't move, it gives them comfort, takes them off narcotics, allows them to mobilize, they won't get deformity, they'll heal their fractures, piece of cake. Everybody wants to know when should we operate because, you know, I don't like to operate at night and I don't want to come out, I like to watch baseball and I like to do all these things, and, but we have to operate sometimes at night because that's when the patients allow us to. Nick showed a patient Earlier today with, uh, in the Letternell slide classification, he showed a diagram and then the slide on the left. And that was a patient I operated on an Easter Sunday, 1994, because that's when he cleared. He cleared on Easter Sunday. So we didn't hunt eggs, we just went and operated. So when do we operate? We hunted eggs later. We hunted eggs later that day. When should we operate? Well, there, I think there are several phases of operating. And I think when you think about when you're operating on patients with pelvic ring disruptions that are unstable, you have to think about a clock, a bomb, and a screw. The patient is on the clock, and so there's bleeding going on, and there's physiology getting disturbed, and that's on the clock. And while they're on the clock, the fuse is burning, and the fuse is burning, and if you don't get them quite right, your patient is screwed. And, so, and you could fix it with a screw. So when should you operate? I think you should operate either urgently, you should operate pretty soon, or you should operate a little bit later. And I think urgent is when they're hemodynamically unstable and you can do something to help them as a part of their resuscitation. Sometimes we do urgent early operations because the patients have open pelvic injuries. They have wounds that need to be irrigated and we might as well go on and stabilize them. And a lot of times the general surgeons are gonna take their spleen out or they're going to realign their urethra with the urologist or they're gonna fix their intraperitoneal bladder disruption. And so the patient's going to the operating room and so if we'll just tag along with them and use that anesthesia, we can stabilize the pelvis very simplistically and then the patient is sort of done and we're off the algorithm. So what can we do? Well, if they're having trouble like our patient, you know, we can go down to the operating room and cut some holes in the sheet and then we can sterilize them with some betadine and use the fluoroscopy and put some screws in. You can see the left is the injury, and the right is the result of just cramming in some screws. Now, I say cramming in some screws and with all due respect and all professional uh, attitude toward the technique that's involved, but as a part of the resuscitation, you can act actually help a patient a lot by compressing the posterior pelvic ring and letting the screws do reductions for, for you. When you have open injuries, like this patient from about four weeks ago, this guy had a, a, a small wound to his buttock, but it was an open pelvic fracture, and you can see that we can just, when we're irrigating his open buttock wound, we can go ahead and extend the wound. We can repair his gluteus maximus complete avulsion. We can clean out his open sacral fracture that's contaminated. 
and then we can clamp his SI joint. We can put screws in the sacroiliac joint fracture dislocation, and then we can fix the symphysis as well. So with open injuries, we'd like to go ahead and stabilize as well, but we'd also like to hide. We'd like to hide our implants because we don't want to leave surfaces for the bacteria to slime so that then we have problems as a result of our fixation. We'd like to veil or seclude or isolate our fixation that's quite stable away from any bacterial exposures. And you can see here we gave the patient's bacteria a couple of screw heads and a washer to, to sort of jump on. We can tag along. We tag along here. You can see with the urologists. We can tag along with the general surgeons. We can tag along with uh, whoever is operating on the patient so that we can do something while they have the patient asleep. We can also operate just a little bit later. We can take this patient who's hemodynamically stable. He needs to have his lungs worked up a little bit, and we can just go ahead and operate on him tomorrow or the next day or whenever the general surgeons or the team that's quarterbacking his care says, yeah, he's pretty easy. They also sometimes want to know what are you going to do, and if you're going to do a lot of operative exposure, maybe tomorrow is better than right now. This patient had his surgery on the day after his injury, and his lungs, you can see, if you look at his CT scan after surgery, see the pneumothorax, see the air in his soft tissues. He had really terrible lungs, and he died two weeks after this surgery. Unfortunately, this surgery helps him. It allows him to have an upright chest. It allows him to not need a bunch of narcotics. It allows him to be managed more aggressively with rolling. So pelvic stability still helps a patient, even though they have terrible lung injuries. A lot of people get confused. They don't know where to start. You know, they, they want to... You go to courses or you go to hear lectures or you read the literature and people are pretty adamant about starting with the posterior pelvic ring. They, they, they quote Letourneau, they say, go to the back, go to the back. That's fine, go to the back, but going to the back also has all the implications we talked about of the wounds, laying on the wounds, the soft tissue injuries, etc. So I believe you should always go to the simple area first. And so if you've got a complete symphysis disruption like this patient and you can do a low midline or a fan and steel exposure and clamp the symphysis and make it accurate and then a lot of times you'll see that the posterior pelvic ring just follows. You can put some screws in it, you never have to open the back. So I don't always agree with that, but I think you, anything you can do supine you're better off and anything that's simple you should start with. It's unfortunately not always simple and so here's a patient from about three weeks ago and he's got an exploded posterior pelvic ring. On the left side his sacroiliac joint injury is incomplete on the right side, his posterior ilium is completely dislocated from his sacrum, and then he's got an iliac fracture also. So he's got like triple trouble of his posterior pelvic ring. He has spinal pelvic dissociation. But we can put a percutaneous iliosacral screw on his left side and tidy that up with a lag screw compression. Then we can do an open reduction of his iliac component, and then we can do an open reduction of his SI joint as well. And we get a very simple operation. Again, the front, we left the front alone because once we stabilize the back, the front doesn't move anymore. A lot of people think if they do stuff to the front first, they're not going to be able to get the reduction in the back. And you can see this is about the most complicated one I've ever had. It's a symphysis pubis and bilateral pubic ramus fractures with an intra and extra peritoneal bladder disruption in a guy who has an internal hemipelvectomy as well as an acetabular fracture. And you can see he's been embolized. And his sacrum, after we reaccumulate his anterior pelvic ring, you can really see his sacrum is completely displaced and anteriorly translated. But just by rolling him over and making a dorsal approach and putting a clamp on his ilium and a clamp on his sacrum, we can very easily reduce that. Even though there's three plates in the front, that's still a really unstable posterior pelvic ring, and it'll go wherever you take it. The plates in the front act like a tension band. So sometimes we have to go to the front, and sometimes we have to go to the back. This is pretty popular. Uh, when do we open and when do we do percutaneous? We open the pelvis when the manipulative reductions fail. It's as simple as that. If you can get a closed reduction, it's just like a femoral neck fracture. If you can get a closed reduction of the femoral neck that's righteous, you need to open the femoral neck. If you can get a righteous reduction of the pelvic ring when you do manipulative procedures, you need to open it. Well, we can't always open it. Sometimes the patient's really fat, you know, and we have morbid obesity to deal with. And boy, I've got a bunch of that in my future. But there's obesity coming, and we've got to learn how to deal with it, and it's not going away. We also have patients, remember, that have a compromised soft tissue envelope, and you can see that even though we may want to do an open reduction of this patient on the top right's posterior pelvic ring, 
we may not want to go through that. And if we are, then we're going to have to do a significant debridement. And we're going to have to have our friends from plastic surgery involved as well. And so if it really needs an open reduction, then we're going to have to do it. But we're going to have to do a significant wound debridement as well. And then you can see on the CT scan, there's debris in the tunnel. There's debris in the tunnel. And we want to get that debris out before we close the sacral fracture so we don't further hurt the S1 nerve root by crushing it. Percutaneous is good. You can see in this patient, uh, she's a stewardess and she was hit by a car and are involved in a car wreck. And you can see she's got a completely unstable right hemipelvis and just by putting some traction on the, on the appropriate side, we put traction on the right side and we pull traction and take her sheet off, her pelvis realigns quite nicely and she, her body habitus was just such that all of those screws came right through the same skin incision, believe it or not. They all apexed. She was just big enough to make them all coalesce at the same insertion point. So she had a two centimeter stab wound for this reduction in fixation. So percutaneous works really well as long as we have a reduction. We've got to have a reduction. It's like taking cans and stacking cans. And if you don't put the cans together, you can't put the screws through the cans. And so a Venn diagram is best when it's superimposed. And so the reductions help us a lot. It also implies that you know the osteology. If you don't know the osteology and its fluoroscopic correlation, then you're going to have a hard time being safe with your screws. And so that means we have to have really high quality imaging. We've got to be patient with our x-ray techs and we have to educate them. We also have to know what the osseous fixation pathways are. The osseous fixation pathways are not going to help us very much if we can't see them, don't you see? And so several things bother us. We have obesity and we have bowel contrast. A lot of times in the early 90s, people thought we had to give people bowel contrast all the time to visualize the bowel. And we learned really early that that hurt us so bad trying to do percutaneous fixation. So we stopped doing that because it really wasn't helping the general surgeons make diagnosis. So the bowel contrast in the patient's habitus hurt us. And then these are the osseous fixation pathways that I think most of you in this audience are pretty familiar with. We have uh, worked pretty hard to evolve these to understand these, um, this is again like this is about all I've thought about since about 1985. These are the conduits of straight tubes in a curved complex bone with hills and valleys that have tendons and vessels and nerves in them that we have to hit. So we're unfortunately we have our medullary implants are straight and so we have to find a way to hit the straight tubes. And so the, the workhorses are the iliosacral ones the pelvic brim ones and the ramus ones, those are the ones that we tend to use the most. But once you understand the osteology and the imaging and you get reductions, then it becomes really, uh, it's not simple, but it becomes simple. Popular, what's popular? These are popular. In 2005, they finally made us these after about 15 years of begging uh, for longer screws. They finally decided that they would make longer screws and this helped us a whole lot because now we could do a thing called transiliac transsacral screws. And transiliac transsacral screws has really helped us a lot. One reason is because we can fortify the posterior pelvic ring with a longer implant, and we can gather up more corticated surfaces, especially for people that have osteopenic. And as our population ages and becomes more and more active with that age, we see more and more elders who are active and have unstable pelvic ring disruptions, and they don't have a lot of bone quality. So the transiliac transsacral screws help us in many ways, but especially with that population of patients. Yeah, but things can go wrong if you do things that you don't know how to do. And so this is uh, don't go ninja things that don't need ninja, right? And so we, we don't want to put screws into things when we really don't know what we're doing. And uh, these screws become very expensive. The top left screw was a one and a half million dollar screw. You can see the screws go in, out, in, especially for dysmorphs like the top right. The bottom left is a screw that just went beyond the midline. It was an oblique screw. And when the doctor was putting it in on the injured side, he was careful of the iliac cortical density and the alar slope, but then forgot that there was another ala slope on the other side. And that iliac artery and iliac vein are right at the tip of that screw. And then you can see what happens when you put the screws in the canal. The rehab is pretty standard, I think, like for most orthopedic rehabilitation. Once you get accurate reduction and stable internal fixation, then you rehab the patient. Usually we protect them for about six weeks on their injured side. And it's a long six weeks. It's a very long six weeks for people that are on crutches. They'll tell you it doesn't go by fast. 
And then the second six weeks, we let them start putting a little bit more weight on the limb, and that's a little bit better because they do a thing called progressive partial weight bearing and they advance. We don't do a lot of strengthening exercises in the first six weeks. We just do isometrics so we don't overpower our fixation. You can see that we took him to the operating room at the first day as soon as they cleared him when we cut holes in the sheet like you saw. We used those screws to put the posterior pelvic ring together. You saw the reduction on the CT scan earlier and it's excellent. And then we took him back a couple of days later and put the frame on to close his symphysis pubis. We put a screw in his ramus to stabilize his ramus and they did a, put him up in lithotomy after we had stability and converted his suprapubic tube into a urethral catheter to strut his urethral disruption. So I'll turn the rest of it over now to Dr. Feruzabadi. Thank you, Dr. Rao. So this portion of the talk, we're going to be looking at outcomes of pe pelvic ring injury and specifically what matters. Now, as Dr. Rao commonly states, we only know what's at the tip of the iceberg, so there's a lot we don't know about. But some of the factors that we do know about are open versus closed injuries, the effect of associated injuries, then looking at things like neurological injuries as well as urological injuries, and the last thing we'll focus on is the reduction, alignment, and fixation. How do we measure what matters? This is a difficult question. There's common outcome instruments that can be used on a broad scale. You can use things such as global measurement instruments such as the SF36. You could narrow it down a bit and look at system-specific measurement instruments such as the MFA scores. Or you can use disease-specific measurement instruments, such as the DASH score that we use for the upper extremity. In the pelvis, a commonly used one is the Majeed score. Now jumping right into it, looking at open versus closed injuries. Open pelvic ring fractures account for about 2 to 4% of all pelvic ring injuries. Morbidity and mortality is higher for open injuries. Acutely, it's due to hemorrhage on a delayed basis due to multi-organ failure and sepsis. Looking at these three papers, the top paper is a retrospective review looking at a series of uh, 44 patients and comparing them to closed injuries. They have lower SF36 scores, specifically in the areas of chronic pain and employment. The second paper is also a retrospective study looking at open ring fractures and the patients that do the worst are the ones that have open pelvic ring fractures as well as a rectal injury. Now the last paper looked at open injuries, stable versus unstable uh, fracture patterns. And the patients that have unstable fractures have a lot of difficulty with activities of daily living, and the patients that have stable fractures tend to do well when it comes to activities of daily living. Now, in terms of associated injuries, we know that patients with unstable pelvic rings have high rates of associated injuries. Dr. Routes published on this, and the average injury severity score, he notes, is about 22. So about 75 to 80 percent of these patients have some sort of other injury, the most common being in the area of the chest occurring at about 67%. Next is long bones, about 50%. Then is the spine at about uh, 25%. This is a case example of a patient from last year. She's morbidly obese, has hepatitis C. She has sustained this unstable pelvic ring fracture. She underwent percutaneous uh, fixation for her pelvic ring fracture, but she also has a segmental tibia and a humerus fracture, both of which underwent intermedullary nailing. At seven months out, her biggest complaint is her proximal humerus. So the role of these associated injuries is difficult to assess, but we know that they do matter. Moving on to neurological injury, the reported incidence of neurological injury in unstable pelvic rings is anywhere from about 22 to 50 percent, the higher end 50 percent being for vertical shear uh, type mechanisms. We also know that neurological injuries do matter, but it's difficult to assess and study neurological injuries. And the reason for that is that there's such a high rate of intra and inter-observer reliability with the clinical examination. Next is really urological injuries, and the incidence here is reported anywhere from about 4%, this being all comers, uh, unstable and stable pelvic ring injuries, and it's reported as high as 37%. Erectile dysfunction is a common problem occurring in about 25 to 40% of male, and more recently there's been a focus on pelvic ring injuries in women and the effects, the long-term effects. A uh, study this year published by Heather Vallier looked at a series of 187 women with pelvic ring injuries, and at one year out, 56% of them had pain with intercourse. The patients that had pain with intercourse had lower MFA scores. So uh, urological injuries and injuries that lead to things such as pain with intercourse can have long-term effects on outcomes. Now, the largest series looking at genitourinary issues is done by the urology group here. They did a retrospective study of 1,238 
patients and looked at these patients that did not have any genitourinary uh, injury on presentation. At one year out, 21% of them had some sort of sexual dysfunction. The sacroiliac fracture was a risk factor for men and pubic diastasis a risk factor uh, for women. And the sexual dysfunction led to lower quality of life scores. They looked at the SF36 scores for these patients. The tr top chart represents the chart for uh, men. The bottom chart represents the chart for women. This is looking at both sexual as well as excretory dysfunction at one year out. And you can see in the eight different areas for the SF36 scores, a lot of these have statistically significant uh, uh, differences in regards to lower SF36 scores um, for these patients. So then we come to the importance of reduction in overall alignment. This is an area that's difficult to assess when looking at the literature because most of the studies in the past have looked at x-rays. And if you look at an x-ray postoperatively, it's really hard to tell how good your reduction is. But that's where we get our data currently. And very few people are getting postoperative CT scan. So it makes studying uh, alignment and reduction difficult. But the papers that we do go back on and look at are um, one of the most commonly studied is the one by Majid. He performed an anterior external fixation for 42 unstable pelvic rings, and he noted that anatomic reduction correlated with the Majid score. The next, patient, uh, the next paper was by Lindau looking at a series of 112 uh, patients that also received anterior external fixation for unstable pelvic rings, and he noted that vertical displacement more than 10 millimeters led to worse uh, outcome scores. And the last paper was purely looking at a series of patients with 22 sacroiliac disruptions, and this study noted that anatomic reduction, which was defined as less than 0.5 millimeters, made a difference in regards to outcomes, specifically MFA scores and Majid scores. So now looking at the overall functional outcomes of patients with unstable pelvic rings, that being the B and C type injuries, Dr. Rout looked at a series of 46 patients and performed SF36 scores. And what he noted was the, there was a difference in regards to physical outcome scores as well as mental health outcome scores, but he didn't find a difference between B and C type injuries. Tornetta the same year wanted to look at B and C type uh, injuries, but he, what he looked at was, are people returning to work, and if they are going to work, are they going back to what they were doing before, and are they requiring assistance uh, with ambulation? So as you can see, for the B type injuries, a majority of the patients are going back to the previous work they were doing prior to injury. With the C type injuries, less patients are going back to what they were doing. A significant number of them had to change their jobs, and a significant number required assistance with ambulation. Suzuki performed a study in 2007 looking at a series of 57 patients using a number of outcome measurement instruments, uh, specifically looking at conservative management, which was 23 patients, looking at anterior external fixation, 22 patients, and the last set of patients, 12 of them, receiving anterior with posterior external fixation. He, much like Dr. Rout, found a decrease in physical outcome scores. He did not find a correlation between uh, injury severity scores and fracture type, but there was definitely a positive correlation between neurological injury and lower scores. Now, the final paper we're going to discuss is out of a group at the University of Heraklion on Crete. It's an island uh, of Greece. And they wanted to perform a systematic review on pelvic ring injuries and outcomes. So they used the Boolean operator terms, pelvic ring fractures and outcomes. This led to 818 papers. Then uh, they had a set of exclusion criteria. The biggest exclusion criteria was excluding papers that only looked at stable ring fractures. This resulted in 17 studies. What they did is they took these 17 studies and divided on studies that had information on a conservative management, studies that had uh, information on anterior fixation alone and studies that had fi uh, uh, information on posterior fixation. And what they noted was that the key differences here really were walking capacity. The groups that either had anterior fixation or posterior fixation did better than the conservative group. The quality of reduction was best with the group that had anterior and posterior fixation. And the malunion rates were the lowest for the group that had anterior plus posterior uh, fixation. So to summarize, these are major injuries with long-term implications. Soft tissue injuries as well as neurological injuries as well as urological injuries do matter. Residual displacement can lead to a worse prognosis and non-operative management and external fixation alone don't do as well as open induction internal fixation or anterior plus posterior fixation. Thank you.